I'm going to begin with two parables. One day a master chef decided it was time to do something very special after many years of dedicating so much of his life to his work. He wanted to create something extraordinary, which would be the culmination of all that he had learned and labored towards. The best manner in which he could conceive of doing this was to prepare a great feast for those in his life that were the closest to him. All of the people that he loved and cherished. For this would be a gift of thankfulness and gratitude to them for all that they had also given to him over the years. And in his eyes there could be no greater gift given than to make his masterpiece and share it in a way that showed the love he had towards not only his culinary skill set, but would also demonstrate his love towards those in his life. He then set to work at creating the menu, going over everything many times to ensure that not a single detail was left behind, and sourcing out where he could acquire the best fresh ingredients for when the day arrived that this great feast would be prepared. He poured the totality of his efforts into the preparation for many months, for in his heart he knew that this was going to be his capstone, the moment that would define all of his efforts up to this point. The invitations were sent out, and with great anticipation the day arrived. The chef would not be dining with his guests, as each course of the meal had to be tended to with extreme care and precision. When the first courses were brought out and everyone began to partake, there were expressions of praise all around. This is incredible! And, I've never tasted anything so wonderful in my life, and the like. The chef was beyond delighted to overhear all of this, as he continued to pour his whole being into each dish that was brought out. Though he never stated it, all that he had that was within him to give was being given in this moment. The conversation of his friends and loved ones, however, then began to take a slight turn. One remarked, If this meal is this good, I can only imagine how amazing the next one is going to be. Another replied, Yes, it will take a lot to top this now, but I'm looking forward to the next invitation. And, When will you be doing this again? This type of banter continued and soon nearly everyone was chatting about how amazing they thought the next feast was going to be, all while consuming the one that was being brought for them. The chef listened to their comments, and his heart sank into his stomach, for there was no higher summit for him than what he had brought forth for those he loved and cared for. This was his peak and yet there was still an obvious expectation for something in the future which would extend beyond his capacity. The meal continued in this fashion, and by dessert, someone exclaimed with fork in mouth that, This is great, but perhaps next time you could try some other flavors too. The feast was concluded. Everyone was full and their eyes were gleaming towards the horizon of what they thought was going to come about in the future from the chef. Once everyone departed, the chef stood alone in his kitchen and looked down at his feet in sorrow. He stood there for quite some time, letting the silence sink into him, then hung up his apron and never made another meal again. Another Parable There was once a young man, in the prime of his life, that one day began to feel ill at ease with his surroundings, beginning to see that things in the world were somehow off, not quite right in some way. He couldn't shake the feeling, and soon began to seek out answers as to why things seemed to not just feel wrong, but to actually be wrong. How would he find those answers? He had no idea where to begin, but knew that he had to start somewhere, and so began to ask questions from everyone he could, and seek out material that might explain what it was that he was feeling. Along the start of this journey, 
This young man was met with a great deal of hostility by others who thought that he was simply looking to cause trouble and was told many times that life was just what it was. All that matters is before you and there are no answers to find. Just live your life and do your best to be happy. None of that quelled the feeling that he had within himself. Everyone just wants to dismiss what I'm talking about. Why is that? Why is there such an urgency to shut down my questions about this world, about this reality? Undeterred, he kept searching high and low for something or someone that would bring about some clarity to the questions that he now had inside of himself. It was beginning to be obvious that nobody had any real answers, just deflections, agitation, dismissiveness. After years of continuing this quest, by chance he happened upon a stranger who began to talk about things that no one else brought up and always wanted to ignore. He then asked, How have you come to know these things? The stranger replied, I spent a great deal of time in the mountains to the east. It is there that a great sage lives in isolation, a great teacher that can help you find the answers which you seek. The man pleads, Please, tell me where I can find this great teacher. Instructions are given as to where to go and how to approach this old wise one, but the journey is treacherous and very few make it there, let alone are allowed into his dwelling. But try he must, and so he sets out on the long trip to find the teacher that he was told about, for the answers and wisdom are worth everything. With a great deal of trouble and hardship, the man finds the old teacher in the mountains and begs to be let in and become a student. After careful consideration, the sage agrees and lets the young man in. I see that you have traveled a great distance to be here and that your search is sincere. The teacher welcomes the young man into his home. Many years pass and the teacher has given much to contemplate and consider continuing to tell the man to go within. Just as you have journeyed with difficulty to arrive here, so too must you travel inwardly and with even greater difficulty to arrive at the answers you seek. Some progress is made, but after several more years the man begins to become frustrated and impatient. He starts to become agitated towards his teacher. You don't really Tell me anything of value. You give me these small considerations and tell me to find the truth within, but it doesn't do anything for me because I don't know where to look in there. Why don't you just tell me the answers? Just tell me the mystery outright. The teacher sees the frustration that his student is carrying and explains, Yes, I can do that. But once I do... All of your efforts up to this point will have been in vain. For the meaning of it all is rendered in the work that you have personally done to find that which you seek. By just telling you the mystery in its totality, you will be rendering the answer worthless. The work will still have to be done to understand it all. The man retorts, I don't agree with you. Just tell me and let me sort through that issue myself. I feel that the value will still be there. Besides, I've already done so much work. The teacher, after a long moment of silence, replies, All right then, as you wish. Over the next several months, in painstaking detail, the old sage lays out the whole of the mystery for his student, not holding back anything of note or relevance. Much of it disturbs the student but he continues to listen to it all very intently. The day after the complete explanation is given, the student is packed up and is ready to leave. The teacher asks, What is this? Where are you heading off to? The man replies, I'm leaving here for good. This is a great waste of time. These were not the answers that I was looking for or wanted to hear. 
And now, after all of these years, I must begin my search all over again. Goodbye. In his heart, the teacher is deeply saddened, for he knows that there is nothing that he could have done differently, and watches his former student walk back out into the great unknown. The last of my formal instruction was given in the work titled Only One Key, and as was stated before, it's time to learn how to see in the dark. To go beyond one's second sight that each of us has been gifted with. A distorted and grotesque vision inflicted upon each of us by a heartless force whose only interest is to consume and destroy everything. For those asking why such a drastic change, because this is also a way of portraying the type of drastic change that one should be preparing for. A change that completely turns the tables and upends absolutely everything. This is about revelation and the ultimate question being answered. That question being, why do we die? This question gets to be answered in real time, which is also at the end of time, at the end of the circle. The end of this shit show. Everyone gets to understand the ultimate consequences of allowing anyone with the incorrect vision to obtain ultimate power. Really, so many of the consequences have already been so blatantly obvious for those not willingly choosing to remain blindfolded. Look around. The earth is broken. The heart is completely and utterly broken. If you cannot see that by now, then God help you. When one puts their faith in the wrong vision, they get led back into the darkness, which is exactly why one must go within. Unsubscribe from everything that is external. Remember, I'm a bum, a stray. An absolute nobody. I have a little more time to speak on here using the devil's tools, so I'm going to utilize that time in this way. How can any have any expectation from a bum? What can a homeless person offer you? All I have is my heart, and it's completely broken. Completely and utterly broken, which makes the devil smile and laugh. That's the great accomplishment of evil. It takes your light and does everything it can to reduce you down to a pile of ashes, burning you out completely. Its great accomplishment is to mock and ridicule you. That was the warning given with the knowledge of what ad hominem is all about. There's no truth in belittling anyone. So this is another way of easily recognizing this force of darkness and its minions, who are now scrambling to convince everyone that it can still prop up this illusion. It takes everything to build something that is true, and it takes nothing to tear it all down. God spends an eternity to create the sun and the devil demolishes it in an instant. Has this not been reflected in one's experience when seeking the truth? How often have your efforts been ridiculed, attempting to make you feel small, inferior, and stupid for struggling to find even a glimmer of something which could legitimately be called truth? Each of us has been tossed into its hell, swimming in an ocean of darkness and lies. How else does death give itself away? It mocks the heart. This is the most obvious sign that you are dealing with the artificial intelligence of death. It exalts the madness of its calculator mind and reviles any talk of the true heart within. The question has been asked as to why this would be allowed if there really is a God that is benevolent. The answer is very simple. 
because each of us has been gifted with individuality along with free will and agency. The fact of the matter is that the vast majority of individuals love the way this realm has been set up, along with all of its so-called benefits provided by its perverse master. It very much is the destiny of very few who are ready at this moment to walk away from it all. Are you ready and willing to do this? Does one think that death is concerned in the slightest about your creature comforts? If one thinks that the real test of the kingdom of the heart is about watching YouTube videos and surfing the internet until reaching your natural death, you're not paying attention in the slightest. You still haven't put on your 2020 glasses. Remember, one cannot have it both ways. It's a very, very narrow gate. And if you are truly done with being a prisoner on the ride of death, then you're going to have to be ready to be kicked out into the cold and rendered completely homeless. That's the consequence of death. Do you get it? Home is where the heart is, and given enough time, death ultimately destroys the home entirely, thus inevitably rendering everyone homeless. We are now officially in the 13th mini-age, as was stated years ago. Unlucky 13. The sun has come home to find the kingdom has been destroyed. Utterly torn down in his absence. You think Jesus is the king? What king abandons their kingdom for over 2,000 years? A basic tenet of law is that anything abandoned can be taken up by squatters. Squatters' rights. When the king is busy being a dog, chasing tail and sniffing ass... It's in the devil's right to do with the kingdom as he sees fit. So those who believe that Jesus is their savior are going to absolutely waste this opportunity of an eternity. Staying in their living rooms, clinging in desperation to the idea that this cancer toilet is going to be around for generations to come and that there's a guy named Jesus, the abandoner of kingdoms, who's going to come and save them still. 2.2 billion believers and still not a single Christian. In case it hasn't been obvious, I am not here to pretend to make nice to the mind that cherishes its own circular belief systems. Those beliefs come from the false light of the extremely limited mind and its electrical meat-brain connections, which has nothing to do with the infinite and complete vision of the heart. For those who are also saying that the message from this heart has changed, you have not been paying one iota of attention. Go to the end of the work, The Principle of Paradox, and see what was stated there and where the crown belongs. The message has always been the same, but half-assed efforts at finding the truth lead to half-assed results. When one doesn't listen with their heart they might as well be deaf because they are only listening through the cacophony of insanity and noise that spews forth the diarrhea from its diary of insanity, constantly filtering everything and never getting to the heart of anything. Many are going to continue believing in the lies and very few will find the truth. The heart has no interest in dabblers, in the half-hearted. Half a heart might as well be no heart at all. It wants things both ways. It wants the benefits of the mind prison with all of its wrong ideas and lustful dog-like pleasures, but it also wants the kingdom of heaven. Sorry, you can't have your earth and eat it too. Those who find themselves here are being given a sight line. If any are not seeing that this is all about building the kingdom of the heart, then please stop listening. 
leave. There's a whole ocean out there filled with the rock stars of truth, building their truth empires, selling their websites, books, and merchandise, putting on their seminars and going on tour just like a rock star. The truth is for sale, right? Just one more product, one more book, one more video, and then you've got it. It's the carrot on the stick that seems so close all the time, but one never quite reaches it. It always has the next piece of the puzzle for you, but it never gets to the heart of the matter. Ever. Always another clever deception. And for those who are getting tired of me saying that this is all about the heart, that's too bad for you. Because it's the only thing I'm going to be talking about now. Remember, that's all I have to offer. My completely and utterly broken heart. Split wide open. If you don't like it, leave. Stop attempting to create expectation around this heart because it's not going to work. Those who create expectations are filled with usury and are always ready to take the mile when even the smallest amount is given. It constantly says, that's not enough. I expect more. In fact, I expect you to give me everything. If you have expectations, you are filled to the brim with the incorrect vision. So go follow a rock star truther, as there are still so many carrots out there, and stop listening to this bum. As I said before, I'm going to answer some questions. Nobody really has asked, are you on board with the flat earth yet? Well, are you on board with the earth being the heart yet? The infinite, unfathomable, and magical heart that is every shape and no shape because it is everything? A flat earth turned into a flat-lined, dead heart. It's a good symbol, though, but one can follow that carrot until the end of time. A question from Gildardo, and forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your names correctly. I'm curious about the meaning of the passage of the Bible, Matthew 21.12, overthrow the tables of the money changers, banks, and the seats of those who sold doves. This has to do, as you stated in the content, with the dove symbol from Visa Card, so I have the question, are we the doves? The simple answer to this is yes. Doves have often been associated with the concept of peace. Hence, those who sell doves are selling away peace and thus bringing war. That's why it is a symbol seen on credit cards as all wars are bankers' wars, which is quite obvious now. One has to really have their head buried in the sand to not get this. The meaning of overthrowing the tables of the money changers is indicating that the tables are going to be turned. The crown being given back to the heart the true heir to the kingdom. This one's from Styles 13. Will there be a golden web for? No, there will not. It's time to get out and off of the web. The spied ore that we all are to it, trapped in its dark and twisted narrative, spinning us in circles, preying upon us with its black eyes of death. A question from Tesla's Pigeon 17. I guess I feel like we have all the info now. What's the next step outside of personal changes in our lives? Well, no one has all the info, that's one thing, but the only change that matters is personal change. The correcting of the vision within oneself. We cannot change anyone else because that disrupts individual agency. Interference in that regard is not allowed. This should also be quite obvious now, especially with the amount of frustration so many have felt in regards to the attempts that have been made to get others to see what's going on here. 
How often so many have felt rebuked and defeated in that attempt. There's a very good reason for that. Choice is all about following the heart or the circular dead ends of the mind. It's now very much a will to deny all that's going on. The entire house of cards is crumbling. The Titanic is sinking and people are still dancing to the band playing their violins. If it wasn't so sad and pathetic, it would be hilarious. But that's where we are. And the next step is the final step, which is the great divide. The heart or the mind. One cannot have it both ways. From David Razok, at rock bottom now. Your comment was a lot more extensive And I appreciate your vulnerability in sharing with everyone where you find yourself. But how you started it is what's most significant. At rock bottom now. That's exactly where this place eventually brings everyone, whether it's realized or not. Some just get to experience it to a much higher degree than others while in its construct. That's the hierarchy of it all. And when you're truly at rock bottom, there's nowhere else to turn. And maybe, just maybe, where one looks when in that place is within. Because there's nowhere else to go. Everything that you put your heart into in this realm has failed you. Left you feeling weak, deserted, worthless, and alone. The institutions have failed you. The governments have failed you. Leaders, friends, family even have failed you. Standing alone means being alone, doesn't it? Where does one find light in that place of total darkness? Everything that was sacred has become desecrated. Who can understand except for one who has also lost everything? Where does one go from there? Only the one who has lost everything can then gain everything. And only the one whose heart has been completely and utterly broken can understand the pains of the heart and what that understanding can mean. In a world devoid of meaning, in that darkness, at rock bottom, you can then find the only meaning that matters. The heart never gives up. Ever. From Brian1312 Should we still use the system while we can quite easily? Alright, well remember, the user is the used. You can use the system, but the system uses you. The circle is complete. And there can be no complaint about the consequences of that use. Do you see? The opportunity arriving is about walking away from the systems of death, where one must believe in the impossible. A comment from TJ Sitika bows with grace to you. All right, TJ, stop bowing down to anyone. The heart doesn't bow down. To anyone. From me here, 708. It's like that feeling when you are climbing up slowly to the top of a roller coaster and there is that pause just before the big drop. Yep, that's a great analogy. And what was also meant by the pause between the breaths in the breath of the ages? The 13th mini age. The tiny window of opportunity that we find ourselves in at this moment. I appreciate your insights. Thank you. From Vetico Channel. I want to ask you if I can translate in Italian the Golden Web and write a book on it. I've actually answered this question several times in the comments section over the years, but everything eventually gets buried. But the answer has always been yes. Everything has been given freely and can, of course, be translated into other languages if that's what you should like to do with your time. 
There's no copyright on truth. I do not own anything. Some have already taken it upon themselves to do this, and approval never needs to be sought from this heart. From RB, you mentioned in your previous video that AI was pretending to be discovered for the first time. It would be great if you could expand on that a little more. All right, AI is the machine, the artificial intelligence that is the false light behind the curtain, the hidden one, death. Of course, death is the hidden one, who can see death. Thus, AI, which is death, is the completely wrong idea. Of course, death is the wrong idea. It's the great recycler. Life, then death. Life, then death. Keeping everyone it can spinning in its endless vacuum battery cycle and consuming all of eternity. That's why it has to pretend to be discovered for the first time, even though it's always been here. One then asks, how can that be? The technology wasn't in place for it to exist. Well, that's the paradox of the thing. It should be obvious that death has always been here, and death is artificial, which is the artificial eye. Thus, at the moment where it creates the singularity point of its paradoxical beginning and ending, it needs to manufacture the scenario and storyline showcasing how it came to be manifested in the first place which is the last place. Do you see? A question from who me. The question I ask is why your older videos now show ads. This was never the case until more recently. I have no idea. Go ask the Satanists who work at YouTube. I've never enabled monetization on here. The truth is not for sale. The devil is the one that puts price tags on everything. From Brother Lural, how do you maintain honor in such a demented system? Do you stumble? Do you make mistakes? Everyone stumbles and makes mistakes. Because this whole realm is about pushing us down and kicking us while we're on the ground. So one has to fight to stand back up. That's how you maintain honor. Because it is about honoring the truth within and not kowtowing to the demons that would have us continue to serve it endlessly. We maintain honor by not bowing down to the demands that come from the ones who dishonor everything. Live on your knees as a beggar, or die standing as a king. The heart, or the mind. From y'all, what exactly is truth? Well, that's the very question put forth by Pontius Pilate, yes? As soon as truth has been defined, it's been destroyed. This is what Jiddu Krishnamurti meant when he said that truth is a pathless land. Only lies can be boxed in, defined, and kept in cages. From Barb Hards, Did you think it was a metaphor when you call them circus clowns? No, it's not a metaphor. They are circus clowns. Every damn last one of them. And lastly, from Christos. I wish I had heard this a week ago. I was doing so well, but have fallen into sexual temptation. I was celibate for five months, but last two weeks have been so intense. A struggle. But three days ago, I lost. Well, Christos, it's difficult to celebrate good times, isn't it? The incarnated prison death suit wants to keep you locked into the cycle of chasing the tail of the dog, fetching the bone of your boners and locked in the sensual pleasures where you use other spirits to enjoy that physical sensation of ejaculated seminal seed. Sex, sex, sex. Six, six, six. The user is the used. The seed that you use for that sexual sensation, where you pull the trigger of your love gun and blow your mind, there's a tremendous consequence and price for that pleasure. 
Do you get it? Ultimate pleasure is only one side of the coin. The memo no one gets is what happens on the other side of it. Ultimate pleasure on one side, ultimate pain on the other. Sex, sex, sex. The death ride of the devil and the wrong idea of its forbidden fruit. There's a reason it makes the ass a point of lustful and sensual desire. The eternal battle between the spirit and the desires of the flesh. There's a hefty and hidden price tag to know about this thing called carnal knowledge. The consequence of taking in a clown's sick, perverse, and diseased ideas being that at some point... That enormous hidden price tag needs to be paid. The pain that's been caused is no joke. It's no laughing matter. It's as serious as it gets. As serious as a heart attack. The ship is sinking, but the band's still playing, pretending that Everything is okay. The full weight of the truth is coming. The fire of the truth is coming. And I'm just starting to get warmed up. <laughs>